So here we go. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the teaching and learning call for February 17th, 2021 in the middle of the polar vortex. Um, so uh, we have some announcements that have been popping up in the etherpad. Speaking of which, if you haven't already, please sign in. Uh, Wilma put in the link once, but I'm going to go ahead and put it in the link again, put it in the chat again. So Wilma, you want to say anything more about Sakai Days than what you've put in? Sure, just a reminder that everyone is welcome. Um, we are going to be doing kind of the PMC meeting stuff Thursday morning between 10 a.m. and 12 p.m. Eastern. Um, but then the afternoon, we're actually planning to do um, some testing of the open source health factors instrument um, that we've been working on with some researchers outside of the community. Um, some of you have, may have met Dave Wiedemann and um, at, at other Sakai events. But anyway, he, he and Josh will be running that um, workshop in the afternoon on Thursday from 1 to about 2.30. And, uh, and we also invite people, if there are other community groups that would like some time in the afternoon, we can run more than one thing um, and maybe have a couple concurrent things going on. If there's something that you wanted to um, workshop or discuss in more detail than you do on your normal um, calls, that time is community time. So feel free to uh, propose a topic for discussion. Um, we've also a couple hours on Friday morning, again, 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. Eastern um, for continued discussion and rolling over any things that we didn't get to Thursday morning or additional topics that people might want to um, talk about. So I hope you guys can make it. And um, that's going to be the 25th and 26th next week, Thursday and Friday. Um, also, uh, just a heads up about Open Aperio. It is going to be online again this year. And um, we sent out a, a hold the date email, um, I guess about a week or two ago. Um, the, the dates that we've chosen are um, June 7th and 8th, although it may spill over into the 9th as well for additional workshops. Um, so uh, go ahead and mark your calendar for those days because that um, will be the Open Aperio time frame and we'll, you'll be getting more announcements, more information as it becomes available. But uh, we're hoping to have a, a lively event again this year. So that's all my announcements for right now. Thank you, Wilma. So I, I have one also, if it's okay, Charles. Um, it is, Josh. Thank you. So I want to put in a plug with this group, uh, seeking your help. So the marketing team is planning an online faculty showcase in conjunction with Sakai 21 launch marketing. So we've been inspired by the lightning talk that, uh, that Andrew from UVA did uh, back at uh, the Sakai virtual conference, SakaiCon 2020. And so what we'd like to do is to record some faculty members uh, responding in three to five minutes to the question, what aspects of Sakai make the greatest positive impact in your courses? So this could be uh, tool specific, this could be across multiple tools, uh, this could address issues of inclusion, uh, issues of student engagement asynchronously, teaching best practices or other areas. So our plan is to provide uh, a few thematically based We lost you, Josh. Thematically based. Yeah, the audio cut out right then. Is it now become a Mad Lib? We get to fill in the blank of whatever we want. Thematically based. Thematically based testimonials. I was tempted to say thematically based themes. Oh, Josh just slacked me that his computer died. So I'll try to fill in. And we were talking about this on the marketing team. Basically, we want to get, and, and that was a really good um, 
guests their Terry testimonials. We'd like to get some use cases of, of people, um, you know, kind of using Sakai and how it's um, been, you know, instrumental in helping them, you know, do certain types of activities, particularly in the pandemic when so much of the instruction has gone to an online or blended format. Um, you know, things that are have been particularly effective um, or, you know, combinations of tools that have been particularly engaging to students and, and uh, creating a good um, learning environment. So we're looking at little snippets like that. They're going to be short. We're going to try to um, do kind of uh, a, sort of an edu educause simulive style where we have some pre-recorded stuff and then we um, <clears throat> have the, the people there in the chat to interact while the recording plays so that there's not as much pressure to perform live and keep it to a, you know, a 15 or so minute time frame. Um, so that was kind of what we were thinking, but we would love your um, help in recruiting people. And uh, if you know of any faculty that would be great at, you know, um, presenting a particular use case or best practice that they've employed, um, please, you know, let us know who those people are so that we can reach out to them. Thanks, Wilma. Welcome. Oh, and I think actually, yeah, at the bottom of the etherpad was the uh, email that I sent out yesterday on Josh's behalf. Um, about the recruitment. So um, there's a couple of questions in there you can think about as potential prompts for faculty. So that gives a little more context. Okay. All right. Well, we had scheduled Marty Sukoff to discuss managing TA permissions, but I'm not seeing him on the call yet. So I guess we can jump to some JIRAs, and if Marty shows up, then we can jump to his topic, and if not, we'll just keep churning through some JIRAs here, if that's all right with everybody. <clears throat> I guess if we do these in the order that they're listed, we'll start with the first one, 44605. Tiffany, you had put this one in, groups add feature to hide or archive existing groups. Right, so this is um, something that a couple of our instructors at UVA have requested. Um, they end up creating a bunch of groups for different assignments. And um, and their classes are pretty large, so you know maybe ten or fifteen groups per assignment. And uh, of course, by a few, the time a few assignments go by, they've got like thirty or forty groups. And so then every time you want to create a new assignment, um, your list of groups keeps growing and growing and growing, <laughs> and uh, it becomes very unwieldy. Um, so they were interested in a way to um, to hide these um, older groups uh, from the menus where you select groups to release things to. Tiffany, I'll just chime in here. I think that this makes perfect sense. Another use case is where a group of users might need additional time. And if um, site info is visible to users, they could potentially find out who are members of that group. Well, hopefully the instructor wouldn't turn on the visibility of other members of the group. That um, is... Um, Understood, but it is a possible yeah. avenue and a hidden group could mitigate that. Well, in this case, the groups would not be hidden from the students per se. They're being hidden from the instructor's menus for selecting groups uh, in tools like 
tests and quizzes or assignments where they don't uh -huh. want to see that long list of this kind of archiving is a little bit, bit different from hiding groups uh, from users. Fair point. But that would also be, I agree with you, that would be a valuable feature to have a sort of, um, uh, I don't know, remove the name of groups or something like that. There, there were some problems that we had, um, like messages lets you send to own groups. So, um, you know, you really have to know to hide those uh, groups for accommodations in there, for example, if that is enabled. So Terry, the, the idea um, that these instructors had was that they wanted an option to sort of, they called it archive, uh, archive uh, the groups. And so they would go into manage groups and say, okay, I, I want these, you know, make some check boxes, for example, and say archive these 10 groups. And the groups would go into sort of this archived area of the manage groups page uh, where you could go and then again check them and unarchive them if you wanted to you know sort of bring them back into your lists uh, but basically they'd still be there they just wouldn't be in all of the lists when you're selecting groups to do things for various tools i think hidden might make more sense than archive because archive to mm -hmm. me means something that has been sort of moved out of circulation, um, no longer kind of functional, but still there if you needed to retrieve it, whereas hide is just hidden, it just doesn't show in the list. Yeah, I mean, I think that it would be helpful to, um, to make a distinction that this isn't a hidden from students, this is a hidden from instructor, uh, you know, hidden from lists where you where you add groups to things. Um. Yes, filed away. <laughs> yeah, I'm sitting here trying to think of a some kind of very one or two word phrase to describe it, and I'm not coming up with anything good. I mean, the reason why I thought of archived is because that's what the instructors suggested. Mm -hmm. You know, there were at least, I want to say, two or three instructors who requested this. And the word that more than one of them used was the word archived. What if it was thinking in the opposite direction? What if an instructor could favorite groups and then unfavorite groups like we have with the My Sites tool? Oh, that's a good idea. But how would they get, would they have to have an option then to, um, to say whether or not they wanted to show all groups versus favorite groups in those group selection menus? I wonder. Well, maybe if everything is favorited by default, and then you can just unfavorite once you don't want to view. Yeah, agreed. Or just have a more option when you're doing the group selection. So like you could, your unfavorited groups would be hidden behind like a more and then you select it to open them expand them up i don't know that that might be problematic for accessibility because i know there's already a a problem with the existing um group selection menus the newer ones that were put in uh for screen reader users but um I think the new um, group selection has a search in it, and I think that was kind of done so you can start typing the name of the group that you're looking for rather than having to kind of scroll down a long list. So I think that was done to try to help with the unwieldy number of groups problem, if I recall correctly. 
It is, but it's not very screen reader accessible. Um, and, you know, again, this, this might not help with the instructors who want to see the list of attend specific groups at once if they don't have the same term in the title, right? Um, they would still have to know how to name them intelligently to arrive at a filter that would show just those ones each time they're going to select groups. But I do like the idea of favoriting. Um, Because I could see there being just like kind of a simple star or check boxes where you could favorite a group of them uh, in the manage groups UI. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, to make it a little bit simpler in the manage since manage groups page is a whole page dedicated to everything there unlike with my sites we're trying to save a lot of space in that one uh, pop-up window um i'm curious if maybe it was just like with you unfavorited a group it would just appear in the list below um, instead of having to go between separate tabs um but that's just one idea yeah, I don't know that it even needs to go in a separate anything, right? If it just has stars next to them, um, would they really need to be put into tabs at all? Good point. I mean, in in my sites, the tab where you organize favorites is a separate tab, but actual favoriting can all be done on the same single main view of my site. Right. Oh, I'm thinking of, <laughs> I was thinking of when you hide hide a site from your my site store. But yeah, that's a separate, mm. separate thing. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. I guess the only thing I can, I would say about if you were going to do it as, as favorites is they would have to be all initially marked as favorites so that they all show up. Unless you choose not to have them show up. That's why I'm wondering if they're, because I think favorite to me could mean that they all show up, but the favorite ones are bubbled to the top every time you open up a list to join, to add groups to something. Mm. Or it could mean favorite ones are the only ones that show, right? So I feel like there would still have to be some kind of toggle option uh, in the manage groups that said something like show all groups when selecting groups versus show only favorite groups when selecting groups. And then, you know, if whether or not they were all or favorites, um, when they had favorites selected and all was enabled, then the favorites would show at the top of the list when you start selecting things. That That's just what I'd imagine to be the behavior if there were favorites involved. Mm -hmm. Do you think it would be helpful for folks to comment on the JIRA and then, you know, maybe come back to it if later think about it a little bit? And... That works for me. 
sure. Andrew, do you think you can um, comment with the favorites um, suggestion? Sure. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Thanks. OK, if we're done with that one, um, Tiffany, you had requested 45031. Do you want to bubble that one up to the, the top, or do you want to just keep going in order that they're listed here? Well, that answers that question. Sure. I mean, I, it doesn't matter to me that much. Um, this was a JIRA that got uh, came up in the triage on Monday, I think. And um, so they're uh, requesting a new feature uh, to have students receive an email reminder when an assignment is open. So right now, um, you can add a um, an announcement when you're creating the assignment and sending a notification. And what that does is it posts the announcement immediately when the assignment is uh, posted. And um, and it lists, you know, whenever the open date will be, which is usually in the future and not immediate. Um, and, uh, and then students can go submit the assignment at that open date. Um, so there wasn't a whole lot of detail in this JIRA. So my question was, when do you expect this email reminder of open date to go out? And one of the major complaints that we get from instructors is that in tests and quizzes, uh, when you send the uh, announcement, well, the, the email, um, email notification when publishing an assessment, it does go out immediately and not at a time when the students can actually submit it, right? So in, in many cases, if you send that email notification right when you publish the assessment, it sends the students an email and it's like, hey, this assessment is open in three days. And the students click on the link and it says the assessment's not available and then they complain. <laughs> <laughs> so um, at least I think that it would be better if this an, um, email notification went out when the assignment actually opens. <laughs> instead of that, that would that would be my interpretation of of what's being requested is that at the open date time that's set then that's when the email goes kind of like announcements right exactly but the announcement when you publish an assignment with the open date nonetheless goes out immediately which is right. totally not intuitive yeah. right <laughs> No, I was thinking about the announcements tool. Right, right. Yeah. 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 Exactly, yeah. So I did put a comment in there. Um, I think they responded. I Hold on, let me get back to that, Jira. Yeah, they were saying that they would expect this option to be um, similar to send a reminder email 24 hours before the due date. Mm -hmm. um, so this would be similar, uh, but sending it when the assignment's available. Um, and then I had a couple other questions, you know, uh, would it be, would the sending of this notification be controlled by the instructor or just sent to students regardless of whether the instructor likes it? Um, and would there be a user preference associated with it to let students choose whether or not to get it? So in some cases, they may want a digest notification instead of individual notifications of every assignment opening, or maybe they just want to disable it. Because um, right now, like some assignments, email notifications, students don't have an option to disable. Uh, it's all controlled by the instructor. And in fact, our students do want more notifications, but in many cases, the instructor must check the the box to make the notifications go out. And I feel like it would be better if the box was checked by default and then the instructor could uncheck it if they really hated it.
Well. I would think some instructors would find the idea useful. Any other comments? I would agree. I think, especially with more and more classes being online, like you're thinking about an asynchronous model, like they're not going to, students can't really rely on an in class verbal reminders about assignments anymore, especially if they miss a class. So, um, more announcements like this would be helpful. So generally, folks think um, the email should go out at the time that the assignment is open and not when the assignment is posted or saved. No, because that option is already kind of there anyway. Right. And it's, the students and instructors don't like it. Though. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, I definitely think if you, if you were going to implement this, it should go at the date time that it becomes available. All right, I will add a comment that TL agrees to that uh, should go out when the assignment is available. Yeah. All righty. The next one on the list is 41292. Another one suggested by Tiffany. Gradebook feature to request to allow user to duplicate items. Um, yeah, so uh, this one's pretty self-explanatory. Um, we had uh, several instructors ask about this um, or suggest this feature. Um, they were creating a large number of, uh, of items in the gradebook that were identical. Uh, and uh, so they would have like the same point value. So especially in categories where um, you drop the lowest grade, right? You want like 10 assignments maybe that all have the same point value. Um, so they were, creating them and you know very frustrated that uh, they had to keep creating a new one and entering the title and entering the point value and entering the you know all of the data associated with the assignment they just wanted to have it sort of pre-created as a template assignment that they could duplicate like they do their assignments and assignments or tests and quizzes Yeah, I remember in gradebook, old gradebook that we used to use, gradebook two, I guess it was, where when you created something, you could, the little dialog box could remain, remain open and you could just change the name and add another one, change the name, add another one. That would, worked a little bit differently than, than what this is suggesting, but it made it much faster to create a bunch of similar items. Yeah, I mean, the older in Gradebook uh, Classic, I mean, we never had Gradebook 2, that was a contrib tool, but in Gradebook Classic, when you were adding an item, um, you would have a little link that was like, add another item, and it just opened up another um, title field for the item. Um, but still, that would not be, you know, all of the, all of the details being identical, basically, except for appending a number on the title, which is what Duplicate does in, in right. tools like assignments, tests, and quizzes. Mm. Discussions. And uh, it functioned a little bit differently in Gradebook, too, because you could create a new item kind of within that same dialogue. If I remember right, where you just had to change the name and it would 
just you wouldn't have to change any of the other options. They would they would stay the same. I forget. Oh, exactly. I see. Okay. Wow, this is weird. I had to jump off and take a take a call, and I come back into this call, and you were discussing the Jira. That was my call. <laughs> That's weird. Four five zero oh, three one. Um, no, we finished that send one. Send an email reminder when an assignment is available. Oh, it's still on the screen. And the assignment is misspelled. A segment. If anybody wants to change the Jira there. No, nobody does because nobody cares about spelling. Wilma. <laughs> Sorry, I'm multitasking. I forgot to pull up the next year. <laughs> I'll go back and correct the spelling for you, Laura. Well, thanks. Well, you know what? I just discovered a problem. <clears throat> so I've been gone from this call for 20 minutes. Um, the, the previous one where we now want to add an email when the assignment becomes available. We already have the feature when the assignment, let's see, is it an assignment is 24 hours before? Let me see. I just did it and now I can't tell you. The checkbox currently says it should be 24 That's 24 hours. hours before it's due. Okay, before the due date. You know how um you know how the whole form will pop you up to the top if there's any kind of error and it will give you a red text that tells you what your problem is and says, you know, go ahead and click post a second time if that's okay. Mm -hmm. this, yeah, it's so obnoxious. It, that's obnoxious, Tiffany. I agree. But here's the one that I just spent 20 minutes on is that we were getting the message that said, you don't have any assignment instructions. And finally I said, well, and he didn't want any instructions because he has an attachment with the instructions in it. And everybody in the course knows that. However, because of that, he was not saving his change to this checkbox. It was not saving. So as we develop new features, <laughs> before the due date or when the assignment opens or whatever, these settings should save no matter what error message is displayed at the top. If you click post twice, it should save. It didn't in this case, so we just typed something stupid in the assignment box like see attachment. Yep. Um, but anyway, that's just uh, perhaps a QA uh, use case for the new feature request. What would you do without me, right? I mean, really? Well, I, I think that assignments um, message should be converted into a, a confirmation pop-up of some sort rather than being how it is. I, I feel very strongly about that, but that's that's sort of an unrelated <laughs> Yeah, that's a, it's a separate issue, and we really yeah. should have a bug. I mean, I don't think that's a new feature you're talking about. That That no. is a bug. And there's two bugs with that. One of them is that it pops you up to the top of the screen, and then you have to scroll down again. Why doesn't it just well, leave, take you to wherever the issue is on the page? Yeah, well, I mean, that's a little bit more complicated. I think it shouldn't even get to that point. Like, it should not be refreshing the page. It should be giving you a confirmation pop-up that says, because it's not an error, right? It's just you're doing something that it thinks you might not like to do. So in that case, it should be giving you a confirmation. It's like, okay, your your due date's in the past, or okay, your uh, your instructions are missing. Do you want to do this? Yes. And then it saves and it's done. <laughs> you want to do this anyway? Yes. I want to do it anyway. <laughs>
let me do this anyway. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I mean, it shouldn't be a, a weird message at the top of the page. And that message is so cryptic because it's like, click the original button again to proceed. And there's actually no way to word that in, an, in a way that makes sense because there are multiple buttons that could save. <laughs> Oh, I don't know. We have some uh, speakers of English on this call right now who it's their second or third language. So maybe some other language that Kai is in um, can say that so people understand it. Yeah, maybe. I, I mean, I just <laughs> it's it's just a really dumb error message. And I would love to see that uh, replaced with a confirmation. Uh, pop up similar to what you get, like deleting items in lessons, where it says, Oh, you're going to delete this thing. You sure you want to delete it? Or deleting a gradebook item. Watch out, you're deleting all the grades too. You sure you want to delete it? Yes, I want to delete it. Just do it. <laughs> yes, I want to save the assignment. <laughs> <laughs> Terry's agreeing with us, but I think we're taking up. We're taking up more time now, so thanks for <laughs> indulging us, Charles and Wilma and everybody else. <laughs> thanks to Terry for also being, um, what would you call us, uh, compulsive about our spelling. <laughs> okay, back to duplicating items in the gradebook. It would be useful. I know I've heard a few people complain about kind of the tedium of having to create multiple items. Yeah, I mean, I guess the, the question is, is the suggested behavior that I put there would that be the desired functionality? I mean, I was just thinking of it sort of based on other tools. Um, so in assignments or tests and quizzes, when you duplicate an, an object, a quiz or assignment, it <clears throat> generates a new one with all the same settings and, um, and an appended number on it, uh, right. like dash one or, or copy number want one. Would we want an appended number or should it just say copy? Because I think a lot of things when you duplicate, it just puts copy on the end. Well, it says copy number one, copy number two in assignments. I think tests and quizzes just depends a number like that, dash one, dash two. Personally, I'd prefer the dash one, dash two because it's less stuff you have to delete when you edit it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and in some True. cases, you may just want it to be dash one, dash two, right? So like yeah, I create an assignment and I want assignment one, assignment two, and it's already done for me, right? If it just says dash one, dash two. <laughs> Fair enough. So yeah, tests and quizzes appends a number, dash one, dash two. Um, and then uh, assignments does copy number one, copy number two. Well, copy one, copy two, let me see. Let me duplicate it again. Uh, Oh no, assignments appends copy. So the first copy would be assignment title copy. Then you get assignment title copy copy. Assignment title copy copy copy. <laughs> even if you keep even if you keep doing the same one? No, if you if you do this the original one, it, it gives you the same title for all of them, assignment title copy. So if you duplicate that one, you if you duplicate the original that didn't have the copy, then it gives you another one. With, with the same name. You can't save both of them because they can't have identical names uh, on posting. But yeah, so it, okay. it generates them as, as copy. And then if you copy the copy, then you get copy, copy. Right. Gotcha. Copy, copy, the copy, copy. Then you get three copies. Anyway, I prefer the appended number. Uh, dash one, dash two seems a little bit more. Everybody does. Logical to me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Append a number. And I think 
uh, groups also does that kind of number appending in auto groups. Yeah, it yeah, does, it does. You know, group one, group two. So that's why I suggested uh, having the dash and appended number. Okay, so I, I'm I'm reading the further in the Jira now. You you've got something else that's even a little bit different, which is a bulk create option. Right. So that was. Um, that's actually a little bit different. Yes, that was different. Uh, so. Um, would that were you seeing that as an option that you would see after you click, add grade book item? Yeah, yeah. Um, that was, uh, there were kind of um, a couple of different requests. And so uh, I was I was positing the couple of different options mm -hmm. that had been requested. Um, and uh, yeah, so the bulk create idea was basically like auto groups and then the duplicate was, um, was like assignments and tests and quizzes. And I thought duplicate might be easier to uh, achieve uh -huh. than um, bulk create. But I guess bulk create would be more like what you were familiar with with your gradebook too. Kind of, yeah. Because it was, it was doing it at the, you know, you create one item and then you could just quickly just keep renaming and and create a new one. So do you think both options would be valuable and we should put bulk create in a separate JIRA? Yeah, well, definitely, if you wanted to pursue that that as a separate thing, then yes, I would definitely think that would be a separate Jira because it really is a separate kind of thing. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's why I I wasn't sure which feature would be um, more uh, desirable, I guess. Um, It just seemed like duplicate would be easier to me. Okay. So I guess it would be worthwhile to Create that second Jira. But I suspect you're right, might be right about the duplicate being easier to implement, but I'm not a coder, so I'm not going to try and say. All right. Any other comments about that one? In that case, let's move on to the next one, 44517. <laughs> Take a look at this one.
Tiffany, whenever you're ready. Um, okay, hold on. Which one are we at? Uh, 44517. Right. So um, assessment types are, um, are like sort of like templates, um, but it has uh, a couple of issues, namely that it encourages users to inadvertently lock down settings um, by unchecking boxes that basically allow the features to be edited. So like um, you can uncheck the ability to make a test timed and mm -hmm. then you can't you can't make your tests that are made from that assessment type timed anymore. Um, so this is sort of a, a feature request parent JIRA. I'd like the assessment types to be more useful. We, we've had several discussions on these calls um, about making uh, templates and things like that that are more intuitive to users. And I think the assessment types uh, feature could be used to make a very nice templating, uh, you know, set of templating options, but uh, it would need, be to, need to be somewhat modified, um, especially in uh, preventing instructors from unchecking those boxes uh, to have like a realm permission um, that gives you the ability when you have the ability to um, to manage your assessment types or create them um, that you can't uncheck certain boxes. So if you uh, scroll down to the subtasks, um, there are three tasks, subtasks that I've uh, attached to this. Um, one of them is uh, in the assessment type creation, allow a user to specify um, a default time limit for their assessment. So right now uh, it just lets you uncheck your ability to set a time limit. And that's not intuitive at all. Um, as a user, I expect that when I see a time limit in something that's template-like, uh, it will let me choose one and then that chosen time limit will be inherited to tests created from the template. Um, and so then uh, the second uh, subtask would be to prevent user mistakes uh, with a realm permission. Uh, as I mentioned before, prevent uh, instructors, for example, from unchecking some of those boxes, uh, but still allow admins to because the um, default assessment type is what specifies the defaults for all assessments in your system and different institutions want different defaults for some things so um, it definitely can't go away from the admin uh, side of things um, and then uh, the other um, feature request would be to allow um, settings that were locked by the assessment type to be visible uh, in the UI. So even though they're unchangeable, at least show them as sort of a, an uneditable uh, field, like a checkbox that's disabled or something. So um, personally, I'm not a big fan of assessment types just because I've seen people get into trouble with them <laughs> so many times. And I think a lot of it boils down to that not visible in the UI piece. But also, once you create something as an assessment type, you can't change it to a different assessment type. So if you copy like the wrong thing because you wanted to make a new quiz not based on the assessment, um, but it was copied from one that started with that assessment type, then you kind of inherit it and you can't ever get to those options to unlock certain things, change certain things. So I think if it were more flexible to where you could sort of 
apply a new assessment type to something, um, then it would make more sense to me because you can kind of recover from the mistake if you inadvertently select the wrong one to start with. Um, otherwise, it's a huge pain to like export it out and manipulate the XML and then import it back in just to kind of fix the problem. Um, so that's why I've seen a lot of people turn off assessment types because a lot of times they're, um, their faculty don't really understand what they are and they choose the wrong ones and so it it ends up creating more support issues. Well, right. I, that's why I'm suggesting we improve the feature so that it's usable <laughs> and not uh, causing all of those problems, right? Yeah, now, no, I, what I'm saying is I think you need another one, I guess, is to be able to change assessment types. Like sure. if something was created yeah. using one of them, you could specify a new one. That that sounds like a good subtask to me. Can you add that as a subtask on there? Yeah, I'll do it after the call since I'm screen sharing. Cool, thanks. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, because we've had a lot of discussions about people wanting more intelligent templates. And I feel like, you know, this feature exists but it's not quite there to where people can use it as an intelligent template, right? So I, I feel like it would be a good tool to leverage, a good feature to leverage with improvements to make it more viable to users and, um, you know, reasonable to turn on. At the same time, I do think it's important to have the admin users able to lock down certain settings um, in the default assessment type, you know, for the system. So I, I would like to not see that um, particular assessment type be too, uh, I don't know, fluid, changeable. <laughs> by users, because you don't want them potentially turning on features that you want turned off for everybody. I'm just curious of the people on the call today, um, how many of you are using assessment types at your institutions. Um, yeah, assessment types is a very strange feature. It, uh, it sounds perfect. I mean, it sounds like, yeah, you could save a collection of settings and use it repeatedly, but a lot of people do get in trouble. It's almost like there shouldn't be a default set of them. It should be uh, something where if an instructor creates a, a assessment and really likes that, they can save that as their own default. So what we do is we, yeah, we turned it off to Jordy. Um, Carrie, we had it on for a while, but we turned it off and then on request, course by course, we will we will turn it on, so we know that the instructor in that course site knows what they're doing with it. <laughs> Looks like that's kind of a consensus there in the chat. Yeah, it looks like a lot of people have turned it off. I guess I'm just wondering, is it valuable enough to spend development time fixing it if nobody's using it? Or is it kind of chicken and the egg thing? Would, would people use it if it worked right? And I really think that's, uh, no, Terry, it isn't not, it isn't like choosing multiple choice or, or short answer. It's a, 
clump of the settings for the assessment. So if you if you create an assessment that is um, is timed and it's I can't remember all the settings um, timed or the one they get in trouble with is anonymous grading because then they just choose that collection of things again and then uh, are irritated that they can't see who earned the grades. It's a clump of the settings, not. So if you're editing the assessment, you have um, certain kinds of things you can and can't do, but the settings part is the is the part that it allows you to save those for reuse in another time. Yeah. Yeah, the problem is that the assessment type is really the template that, that allows you to lock down settings. So the, in fact, the timed option in assessment types is not to specify a time limit or to say that you want your test to be timed. It is to say whether or not you can make assessments created from that type timed, which is you know totally counterintuitive. And that's why subtask number one is what it is. Um, you know, this the the assessment type is what you use in your system to specify what features people have available in um, settings. I mean, one of the problems we would run into is people would create something with an assessment type and then they'd, with certain things locked down, and then they'd copy it over to another semester and decide they wanted to change something and wouldn't be able to. Right, and I think that's part of the problem is that users have the ability to uncheck things. <clears throat> and so that's why I was suggesting a realm permission for that. But yeah, I, I see that uh, we're at time and um, yep. we should probably pick it up at a later meeting if we're going to continue it. I would say so. Um, so as far as um, upcoming meetings, we don't actually have anything scheduled, but I think we'll try and reschedule Marty to see about the, the gradebook permission discussion um, for next time. Unless, and if anybody else has a suggestion, let us know. Well, we have a new uh, formatted scores export at UVA for tests and quizzes, um, which I think is really cool. And uh, if anyone would like to see that, um, maybe I could show it off in some upcoming meeting. That sounds good. Send us a note. <laughs> You know where to find us. Alrighty, in that case, um, everybody stay warm and safe. I'm going to stop the recording now, and we'll see you in a couple weeks. Actually, we'll probably see you sooner at Sakai Days. Hi, everybody. See you all in the funny papers. <laughs>